Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, as Martin said, I'm Ron Clark from Imperial College London, and I'm with the Dyson Lab. Um, so at the Dyson Lab, we work on robots, basically, and um, uh, machine perception for, for robotics. So um, as you can probably guess, uh, tonight my um, talk is going to be about uh, machine perception and how we can use recurrent models um, to enable it. OK, so just a quick overview of my talk. Um, so what is it that I actually mean by recurrent models? So I'm not, um, I, I'm not into just referring to recurrent neural networks, as you might think. I'm actually referring to a broader class of al iterative algorithms, which use the output from um, the current time step as the input to subsequent steps in the, in the estimation. So this is actually quite a broad term, and there's many algorithms which fall under this, under this name. Um, for example, uh, like some which you might be familiar with are optimizers. So optimizers um, iterate multiple times on the same um, input data to find an estimate. Then there's also filters. So filters are, are similar to optimizers, but filters usually iterate only once per time step and then do that over multiple time steps to estimate the quantity which you uh, want to find. And then finally, there are recurrent neural networks which are basically a generalization of filters where the update step is learned. And um, engineers, so basically, um, you use data to learn the update steps, and engineers don't design them um, by hand. So in this talk, we're going to look at how we can combine all of these concepts together. So first, we're going to look at how <coughs> RNNs can be used for supervised perception tasks. So if you have some task with ground truth data, we then look at how we can use neural networks to learn representations tailored for optimization. And then finally, we're going to look at how we can use um, RNNs as optimizers, or how do we learn the optimization process itself. OK, so let's start with RNNs for supervised perception. So the first task that I'm going to look at is visual inertial odometry. So in the visual inertial odometry um, task, we are trying to estimate the ego motion of a camera um, or a platform, so of an autonomous car or of your mobile device, as you move through an environment. And we want to do this by making use of the camera, which is attached to the device, as, as well as the inertial measurement unit. And the inertial measurement uni unit basically just consists of an accelerometer, a, a, a gyroscope, and a magnetometer. And then from this information that we gather from the, um, this, these sensors, we want to estimate how this device moves across space. So cameras and IMUs have a complementary um, well, weaknesses and advantages as odometry sensors. And fusing these two um, sensors for estimating odometry gives you better, better estimates than um, using each one independently. So yeah, again, this is just what we're trying to accomplish. So we have um, data, uh, a data stream coming in from a camera, a video sequence. And then we also have a data stream from an uh, inertial measurement unit. And we, what, what we want as output is the, the pose of the device over time. OK, so traditional approaches, um, as I mentioned, like, uh, usually are based on some filtering or optimization approach. But um, as, a, as prior to this, um, uh, the, for the optimization, there's actually a, f a large number of steps that are involved to extract the information that we need to, f uh, to feed into these algorithms. So in, in addition to just the filtering and the optimization, you need to um, extract features in your images. You have to match these features um, across sequential uh, frame to frame images. And then you have to triangulate those features. And then from that, you have to calculate your, your camera pose. And then finally, you can refine that um, using your optimization or uh, filtering process. So now, why do we actually want to use machine learning? The, the, so the visual odometry problem um, can be very well formulated mathematically. However, there's lots of parameters that you actually need to tune in traditional algorithms. And then furthermore, um, the mathematical formulation is only an approximation, and you have to make many assumptions which aren't really met with real-world data. So what we want to do is introduce a machine learning approach that will enable us to perform the tuning by hand, or I mean automatically, and alleviate us from doing it by hand, and um, we want to learn all this by just using, using ground truth data. So um, just to compare our uh, learned model against a, a typical traditional approach, um, 
The traditional approach would require the feature extraction matching, which I mentioned, which is incredibly slow when you run it on a like, mobile platform. And then it's also subject to scale drift and scale ambiguity, which is introduced from errors um, during the estimation pro process. And then furthermore, for traditional approaches, you also need very um, tight synchronization of, um, between your sensors. And um, yeah, it, it cannot cope when you have any outliers. So compared to that, our uh, machine learning approach basically allows us to very, be, do very fast predictions um, if we have a suitable GPU, although we can run the models on CPU as well. And then um, the machine learning um, like approach can actually go beyond what traditional approaches can do, and they can overcome like, um, scale drift and scale ambiguity by learning priors from data. And then finally, they can actually become robust to calibration errors and um, any uh, non-ideal um, elements which are introduced by the sensors. So uh, what does our model look like? That's just an overview of like, the, so the neural network approach to estimating odometry from, a, a, from visual and inertial sensors. So it basically consists of, of two streams. So the first, um, what you see on the left, is processing the images as they come in. And then the stream on the right is processing the IMU data. Um, so what we would do to actually train the network, we tried um, training it first using just random weights and also weights um, initialized from an image classification model. But this didn't perform very well because our data sets for odometry are just too small to train all those weights in the network. So what we then did was actually use a, um, a network pre-trained for optical flow. And optical flow, for those of you who don't know, is basically it basically means estimating the, trans the movement of pixels from frame to frame in a video sequence. So what we did was we used the weights from that network and then initialized our convolutional network um, with those to, uh, yeah, to uh, bootstrap our training process. Then uh, the second component of our um, network is our multi-rate um, multi framework. So the IMU data operates at 100 hertz, uh, much faster than the camera data, which comes in at about um, 10 hertz. And this, uh, the, this difference in um, sampling rate is a situation which you very often account, encounter in uh, time series data. But for recurrent neural networks, it's not really a problem, because all we do is we process the, um, well, basically step the one um, network at a faster rate than the other. So we run the IMU network at, uh, for 10 steps, and then we, um, concatenate that feature with the visual um, part of the network, which you only run for one step. Um, yeah, so this concatenation is then, then done in another um, central network, which we call the core um, LSTM, and the LSTM is just the RNN type that we use. And this basically performs the fusion of the visual and the IMU data um, to give us our estimates of the translation of the device over time. Um, so what we, what we do is we predict um, individual frame-to-frame -frame translations uh, from our core LSTM first and in SC3 space, which is basically just a uh, minimal parameter parameterization of the transformation. And then we up-convert that um, to uh, big SC3 pose, and then we concatenate these transformations over time to go from frame-to-frame -frame poses, which the um, core LSTM estimates, to a whole um, a sequence of concatenated poses. Then to train the network, we um, take a global and local approach. So if we train it only on um, long sequences, the network might find it very difficult to actually uh, learn anything useful, um, basically because of the ambiguities of rotations, et cetera. So if you um, say you have a whole sequence and you move from the, uh, from the starting point and you return to the starting point, um, then the network might find it very difficult to actually discover the entire path you've um, taken. So what we do is we train it on the frame-to-frame the -frame estimates as well, as well as the um, global estimates to make it easier to learn the overall motion of the, of the device. Okay, so um, these are just some results which we uh, got with this uh, learned approach. Um, so this is uh, an autonomous driving example on the Kitty data set. Um, and then here you can just see the, the estimated motion of the um, car as it uh, traverses this, these streets. Then the, um, so the blue 
the blue line is the ground truth um, uh, estimate of the motion or the position, which is obtained from a, a GPS. And then the, um, the red one is the visual, vision only estimate from our network. So that's if we drop the entire IMU part. And then the um, green one is the fusion of the inertial and the, um, and the visual data. So you can see, obviously, the, the visual and the inertial fusion is, um, is, uh, performs the best. And it's actually pretty close to the, to the ground truth estimate from GPS. Um, And then these are just some, yeah, some of the accuracy results. So you can see that the, again, it's blue for vision only, green for visual inertial, and then red for ground truth. So you can see that the, the network can actually um, fuse the information from both of these sensors and use it to uh, improve the estimates. And then, yeah, these are just some tests on like uh, uh, quadrotor uh, platforms and then some calibration errors. And then this is an example from, so this is a handheld, um, this is from a handheld device, so cell phone, um, with a person walking just in a small uh, like museum area. And then you can see the, so we have a comparison between a, a traditional uh, odometry or SLAM approach, which is the green one, um, and then the blue, Okay, the red one. The red one is the ground truth, and the blue one is our. The blue one is the ground truth, and the red one is our estimate. So you can see the from the green one, the traditional approach actually um, it accumulates so much error and scale drift that it completely loses track of where the person is walking. Whereas the learn one still um, has a very reliable estimate of of the of the motion. Okay. Okay. So. Um, that was uh, the first part of my talk on estimating or basically using vanilla RNNs for, uh, for visual odometry. So now we're going to look at how we can actually um, incorporate optimization models into, um, into the RNN approach. Okay, so what we were doing in the previous part of the talk was just estimating the motion of a device. But we didn't really care about what the entire the space which it was um, moving through looked like. So what we're going to look at now is how we can actually map the world as well as estimate the, the motion of the device at the same time in a problem which is known as SLAM, or simultaneous localization and mapping. So again, there's a number of different types of um, visual, traditional visual SLAM approaches. So you can use uh, ones based on sparse key points. So these, like I mentioned with the odometry, they extract um, sparse features from your environment. And then they use those to estimate the structure of the map as well as the motion of the, of the platform. Um, and then there are also dense approaches. And these dense approaches basically estimate the, um, estimate the geometry of the scene in a dense manner. So they, so they estimate a, um, basically depth maps, which are the depths of each pixel of um, images captured in the scene. So uh, sparse key points have efficiency and um, like memory advantages. And they also allow for the joint optimization of the motion of the platform and the geometry. But obviously, we would like to go towards a dense approach because they give much more usable, um, you know, much more usable maps for augmented reality and, and other applications. OK, so how, how do these approaches usually work? So what they are based on is minimizing the photometric error um, of a number of uh, frames that are captured in a scene. So what we do is we capture a, um, a video sequence. And then what's illustrated here is just two frames of that sequence. So what we can do, if we know the poses of the two, uh, two frames, then we can actually look at um, the, a single pixel projected at different depths um, from that viewpoint. And then we can compare that, uh, that projection to the pixel values in a, second, um, in a second frame. And then along that line, which is known as the epipolar line, we can see where the consistency between the two views is the, it, well, is the best. So where is the minimum of that photometric error? So, and at that minimum uh, point, we can uh, take that depth value as the best estimate for the depth of that pixel. 
So now, um, the photometric error, in reality, is very noisy, and it only serves as a very weak data term. So you can see in the plots here, the plots there basically show the, um, the photometric error as a function of the distance for a single pixel. So you can see that the minimum uh, with the vertical line doesn't have a, a, like a very great difference between the other, you know, the other points uh, on that plot. So it's very difficult to distinguish which of those depths are actually, actually the real depths in the scene. So what traditional approaches do is they formulate a cost function which integrates a regularization prior into the, into the scene. So um, what they basically say is that we know that depth, map, depth maps have a certain regularity or re a certain smoothness. And then um, in the cost function, you formulate that basically as this um, regularization term uh, at the bottom, which basically says that it has to minimize the gradient, the 2D spatial gradient of your image um, and find a solution which best satisfies those constraints. So in order to do that, um, you, you just formulate your cost functions, which consist of a, um, uh, the reprojection error between frames, um, combined with a smoothest or regularization term, and then you try and optimize that uh, using your optimizer. So traditional, uh, well, to solve this problem, traditional approaches usually use an alternating approach because it's very difficult to um, solve for all those depth pixels as well as the poses of the camera at the same time. So they first estimate, they take a random guess of the depth, depth map, they estimate the poses using a Gauss-Newton optimization, then they take those um, poses as the best uh, guess for the locations of the camera, and then they do this photometric optimization of the frames to uh, get an estimate of the depth and they iterate between those to refine the depth and the poses um, over time. So this is a very complex uh, a setup. Um, so many people have been looking at how you actually use um, learning-based methods to aid um, in this. And learning-based methods have uh, lots of advantages here because they actually enable you um, to estimate the depths of a scene with very few images. So people have shown that you can actually estimate the geometry of a scene using only a single depth uh, or a single view and predict the depth map from that. This doesn't require any optimization or filtering. Uh, it only uses uh, a single image, but obviously um, it's not very accurate. So then there's also like uh, learning methods which try to utilize multiple images um, to estimate the structure of the scene, such as that, uh, the demon approach which is basically depth and motion um, estimation network. And that uses the iterative RNN um, to estimate, or basically to de um, refine the depth map estimates over time. So if you look at the spectrum of um, approaches that exist, you basically have at the one end, these that require many images and are relatively accurate. Um, and then you go all the way down to your uh, like fully learning-based single image uh, depth estimation uh, methods, which allow you to work on very few images, but don't give you um, that uh, you know, accurate depth uh, results. So what we want to look at now is how we can actually use learning to aid um, in the optimization approach so that we can get the, both, best, the best of both worlds um, from these approaches. So what we do first, um, so this is the first part where we look at how we can actually learn a, a representation which is suitable for the optimization. So how can we actually capture priors about the structure and the geometry of a scene in a network that we can use um, in our optimization procedure? So if we look at um, depth maps, for example, so on the left is just a synthetic um, depth map from a CNET RGBD data set, you can see that depth image contains a lot of regularity and structure, which um, as I mentioned, is, was exploited in traditional approaches to actually make the optimization process feasible. But if you compare that to just a random, uh, well, basically an image of uncorrelated random noise, you can clearly see the, see the difference. The depth map has a underlying structure, so a very, um, basically a very sparse representation, which only consists of like a few uh, you know, cubes or a few planes in the image. And what we want to do is we want to um, try to compress those depth images into this minimal representation, which we can use for the optimization. So how do we do that? 
So we can do that by using an autoencoder. So for those of you that, that don't know, an autoencoder basically takes an image and then um, it tries to reproduce that same image. But the, you know, the trick is that in, inside the middle of the autoencoder, you actually enforce it to compress your representation by having the code size or the, the representation of the image in the middle of the network be smaller than the size or the dimensionality of the image itself. So then the network has to learn what features to extract from the image to actually be able to reconstruct it from these few parameters. Okay, so the, the autoencoder is good, but in this case, we can actually go a step further. Because, in, well, we have both depth images as well as RGB um, that we can train on. So what we, what we did was we tried to, to condition this encoding both on the depth and the RGB images from, from the camera. So how we accomplished this is basically using one stream of the autoencoder working only on the depth images. So that learns um, features which can compress the depth um, into a minimal representation. But then we introduce the second network at the top, which operates on RGB data. And this RGB data, well, from the RGB data, which is also an autoencoder, we extract those features and we concatenate them into the, co well, into the network which is um, autoencoding the depth. And in that man manner, we can actually um, condition the depth autoencoder onto RGB images. And then if you look at this network, you can see that if you only go from the RGB, uh, or if you take the path from the RGB on the top left directly to the, to the depth image, then what you get is single view depth prediction. So to train this um, whole network, we, uh, well, we basically use a, just a standard unit architecture for the feature extraction of the depth maps as well as the, um, well, for the RGB autoencoder as well as the depth autoencoder. And we use a variational um, structure for the, for the, well, training for the latent code just so that we can introduce some uh, space, uh, smoothness in the, the code space. And then we, uh, yeah, we basically just feed in uh, grayscale images and, um, we train it on a large data set of synthetic RGBD um, images from the CNET RGBD data set. And then we basically just use Atom Optimizer and run it for 10 epochs. So here you can see um, it's just a comparison of the code size, which is the dimensionality of that um, middle latent code, um, yeah, versus the actual reconstruction error of the, of the depth image output. So what you can see here is there's actually a, um, Diminishing returns as you in increase the code size be, well, beyond 128 dimensions. So what that's saying is with 128 dimensional code, we can actually um, represent this entire depth image quite accurately. And then this is just an example of the, um, oh, so like for the decoder, we just use a, uh, a linear network because the linear network has advantages in, for the optimization process, which I'll um, show you now. But um, yeah, so this is just showing that if we use a linear, uh, a fully linear decoder for the network, we don't um, lose much accuracy compared to a, a standard nonlinear um, decoder. So this is an example of the, the latent representations that the network actually learns. So on the left, you can see the RGB input image. The next one to the right is the ground truth. The Next one after that is a zero code. So that is basically um, if we set that latent code to all zeros and we just condition the network on the RGB image. And then the second to last one is the, um, is the fully, uh, well, so the, the, the best code for that depth image as well as the RGB conditioning. So from that you can see that the network can actually, with this tiny code size, um, reconstruct the depth image pretty well. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, we, we use a linear decoder for the, uh, for the depth um, autoencoding network, uh, and that's just to make the optimization process easier because computing uh, gradients for that decoder is, is very easy. So um, in that manner, the, the final depth map just becomes a function of your zero code prediction, which is just the effect of the RGB conditioning, plus some, um, well, okay, 
plus some factor j, which is the uh, Jacobian or the gradient of that decoder computed at the current um, estimate times c, which is the code, the, the current code value. Um, yeah. So now, um, when we have a sequence of images, what we want to do is we want to use this code representation as the, the variable in our optimization, which we refine along with the poses to estimate both the structure and the, um, the motion of the scene. Um, so our, yeah, our optimization basically just consists of the motion in the form of poses, um, shown as TI, and then the structure of the scene, which is parameterized by our learnt code, um, uh, yeah, uh, labeled as CI in this case, and then the depth, which we um, can obtain from our code and our decoder. And then the, the error which we want to minimize is just the photometric error. Um, yeah, and then using this um, very small uh, compressed representation of the scene, we can actually jointly optimize uh, for both the motion and the structure of the scene um, at the same time, uh, which isn't possible in a traditional method where you would have to do like the alternating approach. So this is just an example of how the, how the code, so the elements of the code actually affect the represent or, or the depth map. So here you can see just a few of those elements of the code. So um, there would be 128 of these, and then each one you could manipulate to make changes in the depth map. And then what's shown here is just the first three. So like, um, say uh, this first element would be moving from zero to one, um, and that's a single dimension in the code, and then it would be affecting all those uh, parts in the final depth map. Okay, so then, uh, yeah, this is an actual example of the, the optimization process itself on some synthetic data. So this is just with two frames, and then you can see as, as you run the optimization, it actually um, you know, refines both the, the poses of the cameras as well as the depths in the scene uh, to give you a very good estimate of the structure. And then this is a, so this is a real world example. So you can see as the camera moves along, the, the optimization is refining both the, the poses moving and the, and the depths. And you can see that the, the, the depth estimates are pretty smooth because the optimization process ensures the, the consistency of all, these, of all these estimates. So this, um, yeah, this structure is estimated like fully from monocular images, so there's no, um, you know, Kinect sensors or, uh, you know, RGBD sensors uh, anywhere. Okay, so now that we've looked at how we can use neural networks to uh, learn an opti uh, well, the representation which we can use for an optimization, I'm going to move on to how we can actually use um, recurrent networks to do the optimization process itself. Or how can we combine an optimization process with recurrent networks? Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, um, the goal here is can we actually integrate the optimization-based um, refinement with, uh, with the learned terms of an RNN? And can we learn the descent um, steps to make them more efficient than uh, just a traditional optimization approach? So what we do here is um, we basically uh, compute the gradients as we would in a standard uh, optimization procedure. And then we feed these gradients along with the current residual. So the residual is basically just the error term and the image itself into a RNN. And then what we do is we re replace the uh, the update steps in our optimization process with um, the output of an LSTM that is fed with all this data. So, uh, yeah, we trained an example like this just on some very simple curve fitting. So this is a problem which you would usually find in, um, you know, in the sciences. So how do you just uh, a find a best fit curve for some noisy data? So what you can see here so on the left is a standard uh, Gauss-Newton optimization, and then on the right is our um, RNN uh, second order optimizer. And then, um, 
So what you'll see is that the, the RNN actually converges a lot faster. See, so at the third step, it's already converged. And the Gauss-Newton uh, standard optimization takes a lot longer to get to a, uh, well, to decrease that error. Um, yeah, so that was a very simple problem, but now we also want to try and apply this to our more complex problem of trying to um, use optimization to both estimate the, the structure and motion of a scene. So, um, yeah, in this case, we uh, are training through the optimization process itself. So we're actually embedding this, these optimization updates in our RNN and then training the whole thing through with our ground truth data. Um, and then basically compared to the curve fit example, example we're just um, replacing our standard uh, you know, L2 error uh, difference between our well, the estimated points and our observed data with our photometric cost function. Um, yeah, so this is just the, the structure of the network. It looks complicated, but it's really simple. It's basically just um, get, in, get a network to predict an update, add that update to your current estimate of the depth and the pose, rewarp your image, recompute the, the error, feed it back into the network, and then iterate and iterate. Um, yeah, so then these are some of the results for the, the depth um, optimization. So you can see, uh, so as uh, yeah, the arrow just shows the, um, the iteration number. So as you go down, you go, um, you know, it has more and more iterations. So at the bottom, you can see that the photometric error in the middle actually uh, decreases quite a bit from, uh, from, the, from the previous steps. And then this is just the numeric results, which show that the, so the, the pink or purplish one is the, uh, the learned optimizer, and then the, um, the blue one is just a standard uh, RNN trained to refine the depth map. And you can see that the one which um, actually utilizes the, the structure of the optimization um, is able to push the error down a, a, a bit more than the RNN, uh, the vanilla RNN. And then I can just show you some results again on indoor scenes. So um, yeah, again, this is... Uh, we're doing the same uh, problem as we were with the, the code-based uh, optimization, but um, uh, here we're not actually using the code. So we're just using the learned optimization updates. So you can see um, a few differences. The first is that the estimates are a bit more noisy, and that's because um, the updates are completely dependent on the network. We're not actually doing analytical um, update steps. The network can just uh, well, the network gets access to those, but it can um, do the updates however it wants to. And then the second um, difference is that these, these predicted depth maps, as you'll see now, are actually a bit sharper or um, more detailed than the one with the compressed code. And that's, that's basically because the network has um, the freedom to uh, you know, adjust any of the depth, um, any of the pixels in the depth image, whereas the compressed code representation um, could only change the code elements. So here you can see um, just the structure from a single, a single estimate, or uh, well, a, a single pair of frames. And then another example of a just a couch scene. So you can see it gets the the structure and the edges of the you know, the couch and the, the bins on the side quite, quite well. Okay, so, uh, yeah, where do we go to next? What, what future work do you want to do? So, firstly, um, the, the second one I showed you um, could cope with a bit more uh, higher, you know, high resolution estimates and more detail. But ideally, we want to keep the advantages of the learn code optimization and be able, um, you know, to scale it up to larger, uh, you know, larger resolutions and more detail, um, possibly by combining it with the, our, you know, the learned update structure. Then um, there's also things you can look at as can you use a hierarchical, a hierarchical representation of your um, you know, depth maps to get more detailed uh, predictions? Um, 
And then there's also the question of ca how can we better condition the representations for optimization? Um, could we like perhaps integrate semantics or other other information in there to get more, you know, more robust um, learnt representations? And yeah, that's it. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, I, I think we have about like five or ten minutes for questions, if there are any. So, yeah, there's so many um, interesting questions there actually uh, related to that because, okay, so for the, in terms of the generalization for the code representation, um, so for that, in that case, we actually trained that fully on synthetic data and then those tests were on like real live data. So in terms of that, the, the re representation actually generali generalizes quite well, um, you know, combined with the optimization. Um, but then for the learned um, optimization procedure, which I showed you, the, the trade-offs are actually quite interesting because like the, the, you know, the RNN can actually escape from the traditional, I mean, from the analytically computed descent directions. So that means it can converge quicker, as I like, showed you, and it's usually like about you know, a factor of five times quicker. But then it does have the danger of actually um, you know, not reaching the best optimum it can. You know, like, so the, the, the updates are much quicker, but they could be coarser. You know, so it doesn't necessarily hit that optimum as well as a standard method. And then the second thing is that they don't, so in the, the code optimization, you saw that those estimates were quite uh, stable because that, um, you know, that optimization was actually ensuring the consistency um, between the frames, but then the, for the RNN um, updates, it was predicting some uh, structure which, was, you know, which it thinks is reasonable based on what it's learned from the ground truth, but it's not necessarily the most um, consistent between the frames. So to, you know, to, keep, to enforce that consistency again, you would have to train it with you know, a whole sequence of images, and so, so there's, you know, there's lots of interesting um, trade-offs and questions there, you know, related to the, to the representations. But yeah, so I think um, in terms of the question, the, the learnt representation generalizes incredibly well. The learnt um, optimization steps are incredibly efficient, but they don't necessarily generalize as well. How do you measure the uncertainty so you have the uncertainty plot? Ah, okay, so the uncertainty there, um, we just learn like in a ma maximum likelihood uh, manner. So what we say, uh, so in our loss, for the loss function for training that autoencoder, we just um, have uh, the loss, which is basically the likelihood. So we have both a mean prediction and a variance prediction. And then we, um, we just say, maximize that likelihood during the training. So basically what the network can do, so it can either predict a very small, um, a very small variance, but then it has to get that mean you know, very accurate, otherwise it's gonna be penalized quite, quite a lot. But what it can do then if it isn't that certain, then it can just anneal, you know, like increase the variance prediction, but um, get, you know, get the mean prediction uh, less accurate and then it still you know, like optimizes the loss. So, so basically what it is is just trying, uh, using a maximum likelihood training on, the, on those ground truth depths. And I have a question. So
So, um, in this case, the so the RNN here is being um, you know provided with the the gradient information. So, well, actually, the the approximation of the second order gradient information. So, the I, I think the the what it's trying to um, you know the, the steps it's taking is probably going to be very similar to the ones you would take with a standard uh, second order approach. So it's it's basically just going to be a descent, you know, gradient descent. Well, um, so a, a descent based on the second order gradient of the of the cost. Yeah. So then, um, but because it's learning, you know, it, it has full flexibility to, um, you know, predict any updates it wants. Actually, so you know, it could be forming some Bayesian, you know, estimate of the the lost surface or something, and then using that to predict the descent directions as well. Um, it would actually be very interesting to try and you know, look at the, the, the direction it takes and try and see you know, what, it, what it is actually doing there. But, yeah. Any more questions? Slavi, another one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you do indeed understand, you'll be Yeah. So what, what's going on there? Could you repeat the question because Slav is not used yeah, to yeah. it. So um, the, the question is basically like for the, in traditional uh, visual odometry, um, the scale drift uh, basically causes, the, the accumulation of the scale drift and uh, translational drift causes your estimate to completely um, you know, diverge from the correct one. So it just basically goes off in a little corner somewhere, whereas the, the learnt, um, the learned method can still keep the nice global um, like consistency or global scale of the position, but it um, you know drifts away from the estimates and then it drifts back and um, yeah so forth. So yeah, I think the the thing there is that because we're training it both you know on uh, local frames frame estimates as well as the global ones, um, in order to you know like satisfy that or minimize that loss. It has to predict. Um, it has to predict uh, motions which are very similar to the training data. So, like if you have um, people, uh, you know. So that was just uh, humans walking. So you won't have, you know, a person um, just, you know, going slower and slower and yeah, stopping and so forth. You would have them, you know, walking here, walking along, you know, a straight distance, and then uh, walking in this direction and then back in, at a certain scale. And then um, you know that that would kind of be the prior that it learns to to do those predictions. So in that in that sense, it won't just predict some you know some random motion where you just walk into a corner or something um, like this, you know, the standard one does. Hi, um, I, I might miss this something, but um, I'm used to sense diffusion with like. Kalman filters mm. or something, but I didn't get how you fused your accelerometer and visual okay. data. So the, um, is this still, I don't know if that, yeah. No, okay, no, I, I can just, Yeah. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so basically, the the feature. So in this case, the feature. Um, I mean, the the fusion actually becomes just a case of concatenating the features. So, like you can see there, the the yellow part is the IMU um, processing part, and then the blue part is the visual part. So from the, from the IME stream and from the, the visual stream, we just concatenate the features which we get from those, from those networks to do the fusion. And then from the, the, that feature, so from the concatenated one, we learn a, you know, basically a regressor to give us the frame-to-frame -frame estimates. So the, the, the fusion here is actually being done at a, like a feature level. Um,
والله اسف مشكله. What is your loss function for training the network like this one. Yeah, so this one, so so in this case, we not, um, you know, this driving here is actually done by a person, and then we're just estimating the position of the vehicle. So it's a manicure angle? Um, no, no, this is the, so this is human controlling the, controlling the, um, the vehicle. And then what we're doing is just estimating that location. So, like, you know, given only a vision and a IMU sensor, can we estimate where that car is driving? And it, so to train, I mean, the last function for that is basically just the ground truth poses, in this case, which we get from GPS, and then a, um, yeah, the last function both on like the frame to frame translations as well as the global, global pose. I think that's the last one. I think we might need to, I think we might need to leave it there. Sorry about that, that was the last question. Afterwards. <laughs> Afterwards, um, Ronnie, you'll stick around. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so let's thank uh, Ronnie for a fantastic talk.